Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoa, Ko Fakakahu, Te Monga, Ko Waikato, Te Awa, Te Ko Pokane, Te Marae, Ko Brenda Taku Ingua. Uh, now, my Hari Mai. Hi, I'm Brenda. Um, and that was a mihi. I just introduced myself and said who I am and where I'm from in Te Reo Māori. Um, I am here, I work for a company named Rabbit. Um, this is us, it's Rabbit, just like the disease. Um, when I explain the company name. Um, I've worked there about six months and they're a great fun little startup in Wellington that uses a lot of open source and contributes to open source. So I, um, I want to give some warnings on this talk because it is about a very horrible day and I've done my best to make this a talk that someone who was in Canterbury that day can sit through comfortably. I've tried my best. I'm going to talk about the software and the open source community response and not about the worst parts of this disaster. But I do have one slide. This is when it was. It was the 22nd of February and it was the middle of lunchtime and it was, it was bad. So in the narrative that I've got here, um, the, what happened was the quake struck and people by and large flocked to social media to ask these questions. The first thing that people posted was, I am okay. So with one update to Facebook, Twitter, whatever, they could tell hundreds of people instead of sending individual messages like they would have had to do a few years before. So um, Twitter was flooded with these. I remember being very annoyed at a cousin who didn't update her Facebook for two weeks saying that she was okay. Um, we didn't quite know. But for, for those that did update, it was great. Um, further away in Wellington, there was a whole lot of, was that an earthquake? We weren't quite sure. We kind of felt very little. Um, followed by, wow, something's happened. And a whole lot of, are you OK, messages started to go out to, to all these people. So it was a big, confusing mess. Followed by, where is person who has not responded? Um, so sure. Social media was just on the verge of being common. I don't think we'd had any mainstream media stories about a celebrity tweeting something horrible happening. It was not a thing that a lot of uh, middle New Zealand or whatever you want to call it these days was not aware of what social media was, but uh, there still was many thousands of New Zealanders who did use social media. Um, most of the interactions that were with um, social media at this time were using the web browser and the SMS interface. Um, when I did a rehearsal of this talk, people said, I didn't even know Twitter had an SMS interface. Um, it, it used to be that when it was a new thing, people would go out. When you're out with your phone, your only interface was SMS. So you would send an update of, I saw a monkey running in the street, whatever, you'd send it by SMS to Twitter. And you'd also receive a few back. So that was the traditional interface. And although that had died out by 2011, people rediscovered it about then, because it was a really good interface in this scenario. Um, and I think the bulk of people still had dumb phones. I had a smartphone in about 2009, but I'm a techie nerd person who gets free phones from Google. Um, most people didn't have phones. So it was SMS was king on the day, and um, the, old, the older dumb phone protocols, but there were some smartphones out there. Um, this is only really interesting because Google Buzz actually was significant in the quake. Um, and I, I don't know, it doesn't exist anymore, I assume. I haven't seen it for so long. Um, but it had integration with Google Maps, so people could, from their Google Maps, turn on the buzz layer and see things that were going on. So we had a little spike of usage of this, this thing, and then no more. Um, hashtags came out. So at the time of the quake, it was no common idea of what hashtag to use at all. So all these popped up all over. Um, and people started to send questions to Twitter. Um, they couldn't find this kind of information from the authorities, so they asked Twitter. So these were the kind of questions we were getting, and people who were on Twitter started responding. Um, people wanted petrol to get out of town. 
diesel was all there was, and no, you can't buy petrol, it's for ambulances. So we were finding out who will sell petrol and replying to people who were using just the SMS interface, and then those people got out of town. Um, the, the official info from government departments was a very small overworked team. We didn't quite realise it at the time, the conditions that they were working under. They were um, based in the art gallery, which is in the red zone, which is a, a terrible commute to work. They were there for weeks from this day onwards. They were overworked and um, everything was running off generators and it was mobile. Maybe we're mentioning what red zone they can be. Red zone. Red zone is an area of the central city of Christchurch that I don't think on that day was cordoned off, but eventually was cordoned off that you couldn't go in. Um, everyone knew this terminology red zone from the prior earthquake in September, where they'd cordoned it off and then taken it away, and they did this again a few days. So um, the people... Yeah, the guard for the army, you couldn't get past the people yeah. with guns stopping people going in. Yeah, I'm, so I'm, trying, I'm trying to not talk too much about the scenario in Christchurch, but yeah, it was, it was the, the fenced off area and all sorts of politics and good and bad ensued. Um, we'll move on from that though. Um, so that they were under a stress. So I'm putting this in because they, they appear in my story quite a bit, but um, you, we need to give them all um, some sympathy because of the conditions that they were working under. Um, and we later, later learned, this is a tweet from March, that all those websites that the council had put up that kept falling over were run in server rooms in Christchurch in the red zone off generators from the internet connection there. Um, the other, apart from this tweet, um, they also started instructing people to use a web proxy to access their website in order to convince their CDN that you're not in New Zealand, therefore you would not use their server. They, they, they really couldn't get the info out. So this is still the day of the quake. And what we did have is a bunch of New Zealand volunteers who knew each other, a very small number, from the Queensland flood crisis response. A flood is a very different disaster to an earthquake, but they had the contacts. Um, Tim McNamara was the New Zealander most prominently involved in the Christchurch, um, sorry, in the Queensland response. So Crisis Commons had standby volunteers, but only, only one New Zealander among them, which was Tim. And their chosen communication channel was Skype. Because, okay, okay, Skype, closed source piece of software. It was free. It was multi-platform. So this was important. We had a lot of volunteers who were using Linux at this time, um, and Mac and Windows. So it worked on multi-platforms. And we weren't using the voice. We were using the text. Um, but it was awful. Skype was totally awful to use as a communications channel. Um, it drained batteries on laptops really fast. Um, Skype has a feature, I believe, where it proxies for other people if they can't connect, and that was going on and people's batteries were dying. I don't think there was a mobile client at the time, maybe it just wasn't well known. And um, every time I reconnected, it would replay 20,000 messages that I'd missed. That's the feature of their text conversations, and I'd have to wait 30 minutes before I could actually um, have a conversation. Um, so about um, an hour after the quake, various independent open source techie people around the country started building things. They, they, went, they joined together into groups of two or three and started just doing things. Um, all these things I mentioned here started to pop up. Um, the couch apps were really cool. I was really impressed with the speed at which some of people who could build an app based on couch were just tuning things out. And there were so many WordPress installs, which um, they were installations on servers, and as soon as they became popular, they fell over, unfortunately. So they, they weren't actually a very good solution. But couch apps seemed to do really well. Um, this is a couch app that someone built within an hour of the quake. It was built by Miles Thompson, who I believe works for Scoop. Um, and it was the idea that you tweet a thing that you need, and someone tweets that they have it. And it was just joining them up. Um, it's still live today. Um, and he built it really fast. So within 60 minutes of the quake, he had this thing up and running. Um, and yeah, live feeds of requests and offers. Um, it, this is then later at 3.15 p.m. Catalyst IT in Wellington. 
um, decided to fund multiple staff to work on earthquake response. We weren't quite sure what that meant. I worked there at the time. Um, but they had said, we'll do it. Um, the first thing that came out, I believe, was a short code responder. I don't, how many people remember short codes were a thing for a while? Yeah, um, a short code is a phone number that's three or four digits long. You may have seen it if you vote for NZ Idol or something like that, or you know, voting someone off an island somewhere. Um, so you text to it, usually you get charged two dollars, five dollars, whatever voting costs these days. Um, and so we. we um, some people I worked with um, built this really fast using these technologies and, and just threw it up. Um, we had a short code spear, meaning it was for our staging system. It was, sorry? It was my dev. It was his one, okay. It was my, it was, it was our staging dev short code um, and it was free and it was connected to all the telcos, so we wired it up. Um, and so people could start sending in both requests for non-urgent help and um, offers and info. So, and um, all, all three telcos had it zero rated. And this was cool. We managed to get all the telcos. There, there were three at the time. I don't know if Two Degrees was a phenomenon at the time. I remember there being Telecom, Vodafone, and Telstra Clear had their own SMS centre, so they, they were relevant. Uh, they were there? Okay, I believe that they also um, they started to advertise um, to people if you have things to offer or you have inquiries, you can send to this SMS code. Um, so this was a massive amount of red tape cutting, like all the telcos, trusting this crowd of people gathered at an IT tech firm in Wellington, advertising them as a place to get some help. Um, so by 5 p.m. the short code responder was in action. Um, people were processing messages off the queue and it was being advertised on Twitter and by word of mouth in Christchurch and retweeted of course. And then all these reports started to come in and um, we had a little web app where you just process the message. Um, not long after, this really good question from Julie Starr, she's a tech reporter, she, she asked this question and in my research I think this is what triggered a lot of what happened after. She asked this really good question, is anyone actually aggregating all this information we're getting out of Christchurch? Um, and then we realised, well, civil defence is not. And I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to go into why and how and what I think of that, but they, they did not have um, modern systems, they had nothing ready to go, um, and even though there were offers. So here's LP, she did some Katrina hurricane recovery response, wrote some open source there, offered it to civil defence and other departments, even offered it for free, and just couldn't get through the red tape. So we're like, okay, we'll do it. If civil defence isn't doing this, we'll do it. Um, meanwhile, completely independently, an organisation called Crisis Commons spun up a map for us. They called it a crowd map and that they put it on their server and they said everybody come, we'll crowdsource it. And then they said, hey, it's open source, if you'd rather run it yourself, come get it. Um, not long after that, the map fell over and we thought, okay, we can run this better. Um, and basically we did this. We formed Crisis Voltron. Everybody, <laughs> everybody had different things, different aspects that they could bring and we all got together and, and we did it. So the piece of software that we use, the, the open source software that is the bulk of my talk, is a thing called Ushahidi. Uh, Swahili for testimony, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, it was produced for election violence in Kenya, so they were mapping where the violence was happening from, from messages coming in mostly out of Twitter. Um, but it was quite a generic piece of code that we could use and it had a big button to crowdsource. So, um, I had to research to find these screenshots, so sorry about the quality here, but this is it out of the box when we pointed it at Christchurch. So there's a, a button, big green button at the top saying submit a report. And we turned on moderation, so we had our volunteers who were reading it, and um, that we would correct the grammar, we would verify a few things, because sometimes people pass information that's third or fourth hand. Um, so a, a, a report saying that if you need food, it's like 6 p.m. at night, 
people are hungry, this bakery is giving out free food. So we'd call the bakery and say, hey, is it true? They go, yeah, and so we put it up. So that was the kind of information we were putting up pretty quickly. Um, it's worth mentioning about this time um, Google put up their own people finder application, which I don't know that that got a huge amount of usage, but it did exist and, and came up quickly. Um, so we moved the we moved it into New Zealand control. I, we didn't move it to New Zealand, we moved it to EC2 under one of the volunteers' accounts, as in he put his credit card in and paid for an EC2 cluster that then got all the traffic in the world. Yeah, brave guy. Um, we did a hack fest out of it. Um, we turned it black and red, Canterbury colours, and mobile. Mobile was a thing that this thing didn't really do mobile very well, and we, we realised that people were actually looking at it with smartphones and they wanted to get their information in the way that they could. They, their desktop computers at home couldn't get to this. There was no power, but their phones could. So here's a screenshot I found. That's what it looked like after we'd, we'd been at it. So you, you can see that there, you could filter it by category, you could zoom into your street and see what's going on, and you can send things. Um, so this is still the day of the quake. And it's 8 p.m. now, so we've built this whole thing. Um, I'm quite proud of, of what the team did on short notice. People who weren't, weren't, weren't a team before lunchtime, we had formed Voltron and had formed all these things. And by 8 p.m., two more Ushahidis appear, including one from Fairfax. Um, I thought this was all um, a bit silly. We're having three separate maps. Um, so we, we worked our contacts here, there, and everywhere and said, hey, why are you making another one? And like, well, we want to put it on our website. So we did another hack fest that night and made it embeddable. So you could embed our map on another site. And by morning, um, Herald and staff had both embedded our map. So within 24 hours, we had become uh, a group of people who barely know each other, an authoritative source on the front page of the Herald. Um, um, the next day, I believe it was the next day, this, this is all a bit fuzzy, but um, Christchurch City Council made a WordPress. It was really, really slow, and people were trying to find out, is my water safe to drink? And they were paging through pages of blog posts that, that weren't, it, it didn't really help. Um, so I think the success of ours was our use of maps. Um, people could actually go into their area and find out if their area had information instead of paging through an entire region's WordPress installation trying to find info. So I think our UI was respectful of how much time people had. And we had an army of volunteers forming, mostly in Wellington and a few remote, who were willing to put all the effort in to make it easy. Um, the councils were hit really hard by this earthquake. They had some really confusing information up. Um, the doozy I found was um, big giant triumphant press releases saying the water is now safe to drink after that earthquake and they meant September and um, none of us had any idea if that meant now. So a person had gone there in a hurry and not noticed the date or there was no date would have thought the water was safe to drink when it was not. Um, the staff were under extreme pressure. I don't know what their process was to update their Lotus Notes website somewhere, but they, they weren't able to. Um, Civil Defence, meanwhile, only had official info. So the kind of reports that we had mapped would never be on a Civil Defence site. They would never be, like, like places giving out free bread would not be on a City Council website. Not an official one. Um, they had Lotus Notes based website and they fell over a few days after the quake. Um, there was a long planned attack by Anonymous um, as a protest of the um, DIA filter that, I don't know how you stop an anonymous process, uh, protest because who's the leader anyway, but they went ahead and they took out DIA's web server, like they tore down a poster put up by the DIA basically to protest it and it's co-hosted with Civil Defence. So Civil Defence fell over, their website fell over. So, um, which is unfortunate for them, it's not really a, a sign of them doing it wrong, but yeah. So we had a, the EC2 hosted, it's a LAMP application, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, it never went down to the best of my knowledge. Um, it just, it was elastic, it goes bigger and just charges you more. 
Um, so we made contact and reassured some authorities that we were not cowboys. I'm, I'm not really sure what they were afraid of us doing. Um, basically, they were, I think they were afraid we would publish a thing that wasn't true. Um, there, but um, there, so I, mean, I will mention, there are some people who will not talk to me today because I was involved in this effort and they felt that that was their job to do an effort like this, but they didn't do it, the job, so I don't know. Um, so here's some numbers. By the, this is the, the next day we had this many reports, 78,000 page impressions within 24 hours is pretty good. I don't know how many of those were Christchurch and how many of them were um, Gawkers, but yeah. Um, so meanwhile, in the Skype chat, we had 100 plus people chatting at any moment. Um, on important things, but um, every time I tried to use it, it would be replaying and replaying and replaying. Um, so the nerdier ones among us started an IRC channel to have conversations. Um, but unfortunately, IRC doesn't really work for um, many of the volunteers who turned up on that day. Um, work holding their hands through configuring an IRC client with a port and here's SSL and you know all this would not have worked with many of our volunteers, so Skype was the answer. Maybe these days you'd use Slack, but I don't know that there's an open source thing that is ubiquitous and common and doesn't require a bit of pre-configured knowledge these days, so there's a gap there for future crises. Um, and it was cross-platform. Um, it worked on people's iPhones, it worked everywhere. So about the second or third day, um, people started to settle on these two hashtags. So we registered a domain name that was easy to remember on the next day and we pointed it at the website. Um, and then we realised that a lot of the information and the requests for help were coming from Twitter. So we wired up Twitter to be just like that short code. So someone could send um, the, I don't know, the road is blocked at X on Twitter and we would put it on the map. That was enough. So we had all these people um, who, who'd heard that we'd built a thing and they'd heard about us through Healed and stuff, and they'll say, what can I do? I want to do anything. So uh, most of New Zealand just wanted to do something to help. And we ran a, a volunteer training in Catalyst training room, um, and out of that we ended up with shifts. So there were people, 10 people at a time, so taking a shift to process the queue. Um, and we had all these people coming 24-7, I believe it was, and it didn't take much training. Um, so these, these companies, Telecom and Catalyst, both offered a lot of paid staff, full-time working on it. A whole lot of small companies also did the same, and there were many self-employed people who stopped what they were doing and came and, and worked on processing the queue and putting the reports up. Um, a couple of companies in Switzerland and Google Switzerland did the night shift for us. They started taking reports overnight and, and mapping them. Um, and they actually had a, a, an entire hack fest at Google, hosted in Switzerland. Um, and they were doing our code deploys for us at night too so we could stay you know, sleeping. Um, so the thing that was we, we, we were successful and useful to Canterbury from my talking, interviewing people who used it was the map. Maps were a new thing and all the government um, people who could have filled the space were not very good at maps. They hadn't, they hadn't done this, they hadn't invested it. They have now, but at that time they had not. Um, and authorities are very cautious of publish, not publishing something they haven't triple verified. So um, we had a lot of people who were offering water from bores here, there and everywhere and the council was not publishing that. Um, also the council websites did not work on mobile. It would just scroll off the screen. Off the screen. Um, if you touched it to scroll, they would pop up a do not steal my images kind of pop up. Some of them, that was the district council, um, or health board maybe. Um, it, it, there were all sorts of things and they weren't updating. I think just this web, updating the website was low on their list that, that week. Uh, but meanwhile, Telecom and Vodafone, I believe, probably two degrees, um, gave free mobile traffic to people in Christchurch, so that, once again, just for a day or two, I think, um, and that massively increased it. Um, so the councils were not functioning, not, perhaps they were, but not in this, this area, 
and there were yet more, the, the water is safe to drink was very common all over the websites, but the date was very old. Um, so we mapped the location of water. Um, the, where Telecom had um, put a car that would charge your phone coming around, and it would go from neighbourhood to neighbourhood, so we mapped that. ATMs that were working, petrol stations operating. Um, and, yeah, I've done that, sorry. Um, and then the next day we started to do automated scripts. So we realised that there was a water truck delivery schedule and we automated reading that and pushing it in. So we had all the information on the official sites and the unofficial all in one place. And we became a well-oiled machine of just processing, processing, processing. Which you wanted to know if there was a fish and chip shop open, we had it. Um, we had um, people were bringing bouncy castles to go to the park. Okay, this this is an important service if you're in um, a war zone. Um, that in in the park there were places for children to play and relax. Um, and we mapped that, whereas other places didn't. Um, Tim Kong, uh, credit to him for managing all our volunteers. Um, Eventually we gave out logins so people didn't need to be moderated, so all the banks had a login um, and all the banks were maintaining really up-to-date um, info of which ATMs had cash left, which ones were empty, which ones were broken um, and they were updating it three, four times a day and it was all the banks. Um, this is a query that I remember working on, just as an example. I parked my car at a place in the red zone. It's not there, where do I get it? And I, I rang around and I found her car. It was in Turner's car auction. And then I knew the answer for future queries like that. Your car is here. Um, there were lots of neighbours offering barbecues because you want to cook and you ha your kitchen's a mess. Um, yeah, mess doesn't begin to say it. Um, neighbours had barbecues. Um, there were neighbours with spa pools. They said, it's full of water. Come get water if you want water. Um, you don't want to drink it, but I don't know. Um, and I didn't even know this, but everyone in Christchurch knows this now. If you've got a, a toilet with a hole in your backyard, you put lime on top to get the smell out, um, to cover it up. And it was, I was updating every day which places still had lime that you could buy. Uh, this is a thing I learnt from it. Power structures like to talk to power structures. This is a Nat Talkington quote from when I asked him for his vision of events. And um, we didn't really have one, so we kind of presented one that wasn't, I don't want to say not true, but we, we used words that reassured government officials that there was a power structure when there really wasn't. There was, um, we didn't have an org chart of our group of volunteers. We just, just did it. And um, so the, the government departments didn't talk to us. The one exception was the Geospatial Office. So the New Zealand Geospatial Office, so there's kind of a link there tentatively with um, our mapping. They organised a meeting. Um, I didn't attend this one, but um, I think Tim and Nat did. Um, and they brought in um, people from all the departments to come find out what we are and who we are and why are we allowed to do this. Um, and what came out of that meeting is a big chunk of the, of the officials became volunteers for us. So they either on um, company, sorry, government department time or in their evening started updating the info for us. So that, that took the burden off. Um, they had the knowledge of how to verify things that we didn't, so it was good. This is a, a little event that happened on the side with the same team. Um, the Red Cross website fell over. So the Red Cross did a lot of the on-the-ground work and they were unable to accept donations and right in the moment when people were likely to send them money and they needed it to operate. Um, it was a MySQL-related error and we managed to find people who wrote MySQL to come and help them fix it. Um, so it was, it was this little thing, hi, we're these people from the internet, we'd like to help you, Red Cross. And how did we convince them that we could help them? It's like, we wrote the software that you use. Oh, okay. Um, which really helped. So um, we got people in. Um, it, was, it, was a it was a silly error. It was just one page in their website. If someone visited it, the whole website locked up. It like locked all the tables across all their records for minutes after anyone visited it. So people would be thinking they'd fixed it, and it would just stop. So eventually we fixed it. Um, my next slide's a grumpy slide, so I'm going to do it really fast. Um, there was a Computer World article about us fixing the Red Cross, and the Red Cross took credit as if we weren't there, as if they'd fixed it, and that unfortunately, um, it, it really annoyed some of the volunteers who had spent 
many hours diagnosing their problem for them. Um, that they, they wrote a story about how clever they were in fixing it that day. But yeah, that alienated some very tired volunteers. Um, but generally there was a, a very much a just do it atmosphere. If you think you've got an idea, just go do it. Um, no one pulled rank that day that I'm aware of. Um, it, it just happened and people would build things and then just tell people they've done it. We had a, an amazing network of the New Zealand tech community is really well connected because everyone buys tech. So my, my technique for if I needed to contact a place, be it a bank or a telco or, or anywhere, I would who is their website, find the technical contact, half the time I would recognise the name or the company, use some network to find their techie and get their techie to go say, hey, could you do a thing? And that, that technique worked really well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, was, it wasn't so much what we knew, it was who we knew we were able to get to people. Um, Catalysts need a lot of credit for their. Um, they, they funded staff for weeks processing this queue. Everyone from coders working on new things to um, getting the project managers to go process the queue. Uh, they, they worked on, there was a Catalyst person on every shift, they worked on every inquiry in some way and info and they waited through, there were so many manual retweets that we had to wade through to get to actual original content and um, they were weeding, weeding that all out. Um, Victoria University offered space for volunteers to use the computers and use the training. Um, they, they also sent their search and rescue team. Um, Google amended their search results, so we were first result for Christchurch. They can do that. It's cool. <laughs> um, Optimal Usability um, also hosted a training for us. Trade Me did. Uh, they, they put a link to our site in their earthquake resources. FairGo did a thing on us, which was really quite cool to see. Um, the Student Volunteer Army, we did a, a partnership with them. We were in really good contact. If you guys don't know who they are, they were uh, mostly university students with shovels who went and dug the dirt out of people's driveways as the usual symbol or sent, took food to people who were housebound. They were the Volunteer Army. Um, the project was interviewed for, it was on TV3 News, and then their staff became our volunteers. So we had TV3 were all over Christchurch reporting like they do, and they would have info, and as well as reporting it, they would update it on our website directly for us, which was uh, sweet. Um, eventually, uh, Internal Affairs did promote us on their Twitter, which is cool. And Google, as well as making the, the first result, actually put a, a link on their landing page a few days later. Um, Internet NZ funded Tim McNamara to go to Christchurch. So we, we were building all these things and not really sure what people on the ground thought of it. Were we doing it right? Were we doing it wrong? So we sent him to go make local collection, connections. What came out of that was the printable maps. So we made it that you could actually press print. We, re we didn't realise until then that you couldn't print these maps. So we made printable versions and we printed them and then we handed them out all over the eastern suburbs who I believe were the worst hit um, long term. We got to 100,000 visits within a week. And time went by, and the days started to turn into weeks. Um, the search and rescue had ended. The, the focus was now not on the immediate crisis, but it was on how do we support the people who have stayed in Canterbury. So we continued to map the data, but we didn't have the shifts anymore. It was um, normal communication channels resumed. So. Um, we were coming out of, cri out of the worst of the crisis. Um, and we saw that usage was dropping off. So I, I, I felt like I and these people that I was now working with had built this amazing thing. What can we make of it now? And I had to like, no, express those feelings. It, it, this, is, this is the thing and you've accomplished it. So we had 130,000 front page things over the three weeks and we decided we would declare mission accomplished. So we, we had done what we'd set out to do and it was time to wrap up. Um, and also, we, we were tired of the shifts, I guess, because it wasn't as necessary now. Um, so what we did at the end is we redirected, the, it's an HTML link redirect, to um, canterburyearthquake.org.nz, which I believe is run by multiple councils. So they built their own map, and now they have one. We reconfigured the short code for the student volunteer army to use so they could start to communicate with the volunteers and coordinate them without paying a lot of money, and then we passed the anonymized copy to researchers to, we had to remove, these were reports from real users, so we had to remove all links to that. Um, 
So what was really cool um, was we were quite pragmatic. You see, we, we weren't open source. It must be open source or I won't touch it. We were using Skype because that's what people turned out wanted to use and it worked, kind of. Um, we used LAMP. We didn't fluff with um, licenses. Um, closed or open wasn't important, as important as cross-platform, but that tended to be the same thing. Um, the fact that we could modify it within, within hours of the quake was, was the thing that made us settle on open source. And I found that the people in 2011 from open source backgrounds knew what Git was, whereas the people from other environments were like some Microsoft thing that you can't really cross code share. So that I found that people who turned up, and there were many, from the closed source backgrounds and the Microsoft platforms didn't know how to work in a team like this. So we weren't able to use their contributions. Um, I found that many of them couldn't even install a web server because someone else does that. Our code went upstream into Ushahidi, so the mobile and the ability to theme um, and ability to embed. Um, and Japan had an earthquake shortly after and they reused our code, so it wasn't a fork for very long. And um, Libya had a crisis too. So. Um, I wish we could do a better job with government agencies. I, I mentioned a couple of burn bridges there. And I wish that the credit taking didn't happen, but um, I really want to have a good relationship with these authorities. So if a, if a quake happens today, we can still work together. Um, oh, my slides got mucked up. These days we'd have to support tablets. Um, we'd probably use EC2 again. Uh, Amazon wiped our bill, which was like, thank you. It was, it was many hundreds of thousands. Um, and um, there's Insta provisioned in the, crowd, in the crowd, uh, crowd map in the cloud. I don't know if we'd use that because we wouldn't have been able to modify it that day, but give it a go. Um, and phones now have low power modes that they didn't have in 2011. So I, I think we'd have to work around, my phone I can put it in a mode and it will last 20 days. Um, but I can only use a web browser, so it would be like that. Um, today the, the same software is used. You can go see um, BBC reports of violence in Syria right now, if you want to look at that. Um, and SMS as an API was great. Um, we had lot, most of our contributors did not write code, and they're really awesome. I love contributors like that, they were great. Um, and people who care will form Crisis Voltron, is what I learned from that. Um, here's a big slide of people to thank. My name's in there because I copy pasted it from somewhere, but um, all, all these people. Um, and I'm really curious, how many people here work, contributed to that? There's a few here, one, two. How many people here used it? There's people, okay, cool. So that's the, that's the end of my talk. So do I have time for questions? Okay. Yes, Simon. Um, I've had fun with government in areas like this. Um, do you, f you seem quite pessimistic at the end that government's not getting much better. Do you think there's a way forward or should we be, how could we be, how could we make it, um, how so could we make it, sorry. I think I get the gist of your question is what's better. I think that a group of volunteers without a command chain and um, press scrutiny can always be more nimble than the government will ever be, so I suspect we will be more nimble. I also think that civil defence and other authorities are in a much better place than they were. Um, I think they were embarrassed a little, which is part of the behaviour we saw, embarrassed that we did better and this has inspired them. That's great inspiration to do better next time. Oh, over there. I just want to ignore the um, how to ask a question thing we got at the beginning of the conference and just say that as someone who knew some people who were helped out massively by what you guys did, thanks, um, including a couple who are now drinking in Valhalla. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, I was going to echo Simon's question and, and basically ask, uh, I'm noticing a common point in Eben's talk, in Bob's talk this morning and now listening to you, talking about how government seems to just get in the way more than it ever helps. Um, I, what Simon, I think, was asking is, do you ever think they will be better than a group of volunteers at it? I 
I think we could draw a Venn diagram of who actually helped that day and there is a, an intersection of people who actually worked for councils and were working on our project at the same time. So I, I don't know that they'd ever be better because they have, like I say, command chains that they don't want to skip. Um, I like to think if an earthquake struck today that, that all these councils would do better, that web would be a high priority for where you send your information, you're not sending it to the newspaper for reading the next day, that they would put it on their Twitter, that they would put it on their Facebook, they, would, they wouldn't be hosting their website in a red zone generator server room, um, all these things that they'd learn from. Um, and I just think the technology wasn't a big priority for these places, especially not, civil defence wasn't even a spending priority before the Canterbury earthquake. So, not that I could see. Hello there. Um, I was, I, I come from Christchurch, I was there at the time, and if I had known about this, <laughs> I would have leapt in. Um, is there, have you sort of looked at better ways of getting the word out to geeks like me that I was on the western side of the city? I, I could have jumped in with boots, boots and all, but I didn't know about it. I think maybe um, the physical... Looked at it, other ways of getting the word out and well what channels were open to you in the two or three days after the quake what communications were even I, open? I was on the western side of the city I had power back within four hours um, and we could yeah we had running water but it wasn't safe but um, we were pretty good on our side of the city yeah it took um, a couple of days to get it up on Herald and stuff it was Herald and stuff had something up and it took a couple of days to get to the front page yeah. but yeah, I, I'm not sure. The ch communications channels fall over in these scenarios, but I'm not from Canterbury. It's probably not a question for me. Oh, Dave. <laughs> Brenda, thanks very much for that. That was really fascinating. As someone who um, was in the thick of it uh, on the east side of Christchurch, um, without any mobile coverage because the cell towers had been killed by a falling building and uh, no water and no electricity for a few weeks, um, we were very grateful. We heard through the grapevine about what you guys were doing, and I can just want to say thanks again to you and the whole team because it's uh, it was really great to know that you guys were um, batting for us. In fact, it had a lot to do with the fact that um, I wanted to sell my company to Catalyst, <laughs> which uh, thankfully subsequently happened. Oh, Any time, Dave. <laughs> Any more questions? I was one down the front. Uh, is there any sort of uh, follow-on work uh, that uh, uh, for sort of like apps that people could put on their mobile devices, for example, that can um, get them pre-primed before the emergency happens? Because, well, as we found out, once the emergency happens, nobody wants to change anything. They're too busy fixing their broken crap. Um, uh, there's things like serval mesh for, for phones and stuff that like, we didn't have then. I know um, Auckland um, City Council or Auckland Civil Defence have a thing um, for smartphones that will tell you about events like there's a tsunami coming, but that's not the same at all that you're asking. This is not the, the triple one style thing. This is the where can I find fish and chips? Where can I find food? You know. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking along the yeah. lines of uh, distributed apps that, yeah. that will work when the central infrastructure Craps I out. think what I learned from that is if you fall back to SMS and web, that's better, and especially with yep. the low power modes, but um, a low power mode Android app would be quite cool, but I'm not sure. Crisis Commons still exist, and they do have a lot of projects on there. They may have this. They, they certainly deal with a lot of wars more than earthquakes, but they have it. Yeah, well, let's hope we don't have one of those. Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've spoken to a couple of people about that, because once you have a natural disaster, the, um, the kind of attitude you have towards your technology changes very quickly. So when I'm going about my normal day, I don't want my phone tracking and telling everyone where I am. I don't want my phone sharing my data in an open access point. But the minute we have an, a natural disaster, I want both of those things to happen. So, you know, I've, I've been speaking to people looking at apps to say, you know, turn all my settings from my my normal mode to I've had a disaster and now I want to share if I've got data and no one else around me has I want to be able to share that I want to be able to share my location with anyone who wants and, um, and that sort of stuff.
Mm. And uh, we did this work because the earthquake happened. It's not like we would have done, funded 20 plus employees for weeks to work on a thing um, if this earthquake hadn't happened. So it, it was, it's the people funded to work 40 hours a week on an application is hugely valuable and amazing things come out the other end. Um, so uh, doing that proactively would be very hard and it would be very hard to predict what year and what technology the event that this was going to be used for. When I wrote this, the more, more I realised that the things we did then we wouldn't do now because things have moved on. So what we wrote was perfectly tailored to that event and it was people who were available because the event happened. Yeah, this will be the last question. To answer but you, Vic, the several project that Paul Gardner Stephen has spoken about before is they're working on a mesh network to run low power over the most codex they can. Um, and basically that will on send messages. You've got a message to send to someone, I've got enough power to write it. Okay, I've written my message, there was a phone over there on the mesh network that received it. When someone else is online, that'll send it further and it'll propagate and hopefully get to who it needs to get to. But they will, as power goes on, it'll propagate messages. And we've played with it here at conference before and um, it's gone very well. So they're still cool. working. Sweet. Okay. I think that's it for questions. Um, thank you everybody for coming along.